Hey, how's it going? Hey everyone, happy Tuesday and welcome to this edition of Hook, Line, and Striker. I'm Josh. And I'm Emily. <laughs> and Josh was about to be busy typing to you guys and that's why he was distracted. Yeah. So. <laughs> With uh, that being said, you know, welcome to, you know, any viewers tonight. Um, you know, if you do have any comments, any questions, if you have any thoughts, you know, drop them in and we will talk about them as we go through the evening. So Absolutely. We were able to introduce ourselves, um, but let's introduce our guests. So, Chris Emery, thanks for being here. Hey, thanks Chris. for having me. <laughs> so, um, our first question is always, tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, so my name is Chris Emery. Uh, I've been married now for 23 years. Uh, I've got four kids. Uh, in my real job, I'm a lineman for a power company. And my uh, fairy tale job, I'm a fisherman. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I like that though, because, you know, a lot of times you talk to guides and, you know, people that fishing is their life, but I think that there is so many people in, in the fishing field that do have real life jobs. So, um, I just love hearing about that. Um, and I imagine being up on power poles, how often have you spotted a fishing hole from afar? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously though, that would be awesome. Yeah. No, it's not because I'm dreaming about fishing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. So with that, you know, remind us about where you're located. So I'm located in Mountain Grove, Missouri. That's uh, pretty much south central Missouri. Um, and then we were talking a little bit off air that that means that you don't really get an ice season at all. No, no. I fish open water pretty much all year long. And that's really crazy to me, um, you know, because we really have to balance out, you know, mm -hmm. the use of our boat and those graphs and electronics and then being on the ice. So, um, you know, that's really crazy to imagine that we could be in our boat all year round. <laughs> <laughs> um, but is it true that you do mostly fish for crappies? I, I have pretty much exclusively fished for crappie for 20 years now. Uh, occasionally I will walleye fish, uh, a white bass fish some, not a lot, but. But yeah, pretty much just crappie. That's awesome. Um, you know, there there's a specific love for crappie crappie fishing out there, and so I I just have to understand, you know, where you're coming from as far as love for those fish. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, so tell us a little bit about your season. Where are you guys at right now? So we are. I mean, we're right at spawn. Um, a lot of fish are on the banks. Um, depends on the body water. The southern lakes that I fish, they're they're pretty much on the banks. Uh, the northern lakes, like Lake of the Ozarks, Truman Lake, they're they're still out in that ten to fifteen foot range. There's some males running up on the banks, but they're getting close. They're real close. So, do you have an idea then of what your water temps are? Yeah, they're right around fifty-seven to fifty-nine. Okay, so getting right up to those magic temperatures there. Yeah. yeah. You know, there's a lot of us that are really spread out. We've had, you know, a few people check in, even from Canada. Um, and the really interesting thing about talking to people in different places than you is, you know, kind of seeing where they're at and comparing because ultimately that temperature does work its way more north to mm -hmm. us and even all the way to Canada at some point. Um, and, you know, so tell us a little bit about your bank fishing. Like how do you go about catching fish when they're in the state that they are now? So right now I'll start really kind of checking that 15 foot range and uh, try to locate fish on brush. And they're going to, you know, they're, they're, they're moving into the banks on in waves. So, that 10 to 15 foot range, you're probably going to catch your females there while the males are up making nest. And you're going to be within casting distance of the bank most of the time also. So you can start at the bank and just work that jig back to the brush and, and you're going to catch those in between fish. You're going to catch the ones on the bank and the brush. Now that's a few interesting things that you're pointing out there. So um, first of all, I think a lot of people think of fish generically, you know, they are doing different things during different times of the year. And that's easy when we're talking about eating and that's easy when we're talking about like 
you know, spawning in general. But this point in the water temperatures is very specific where, you know, the males are going ahead. They are making those beds and the females really may be lagging behind, yeah. you know, so that's a really cool factor that you could be kind of like targeting each as you go out. That's right. And, you know, the females, they're not on the bank that long. They're, they're there long enough to lay their eggs and then they move right back out to that brush and they, they will set there until they build up enough energy to move back out deeper. Um, and that was the other thing exactly that I was going to point out is the factor of that brush. So what is it about the brush that's so specific? You know, that's a hard question, I guess. It, I don't know if I know the answer. Answer. <laughs> You know, uh, because a lot of times, especially right now with them, you know, really kind of feeding up for the spawn, those bigger fish that, that I like to try to target, they're really not relating to the brush as much as the smaller fish on my graph. You'll see them and the bigger fish are outside the brush piles. They may be 10 or 15 feet outside the brush pile, not relating to the whole school of fish. So, you know, it's that, that is a hard question because they're not, the big fish aren't searching for that cover like the small ones. They're not needing the protection. But I think that's exactly a good trend that a fisherman should notice, though, because, you know, that same fish will still kind of take a similar life, you know, path in life each year. So as a smaller fish, like it will go and it will seek those brush. But as a bigger fish, you know, it doesn't need quite that same amount of protection and it can linger out. But I guess the other thing that I was going to point out from that, so maybe it's a little bit of a vague connection, you know, but as fishermen, you know, I see a lot of people going out to target panfish that maybe aren't doing things quite correctly. And I think that people struggle a lot. So when we imagine a fisherman going out and they're going to, you know, okay, pull up, okay, it's shallow up there and it's deep over there. Like this looks good, you know, but if there is nothing but transition, you know, that might not be where the fish are. So I think things like brush piles help kind of call them in and guide them on that path. That's, that's exactly right. Yeah. And I think also too, you, you can add factors like bait fish, bait fish relate to that brush. Um, you know, crappies like a hard, a hard structure, vegetative structure to spawn on. So, you know, in my background in fisheries, you're looking at like pencil reeds and you're looking at just like brush piles, you know, not necessarily the logs or like the fish cribs, but like the smaller sticks where the eggs will stick to. And, you know, all those factors kind of come into play too. Yeah. Um, so comment from Darren Schneider. So hello to Darren. <laughs> he says, how many days do you actually fish? Seems like you never take a day off. <laughs> <laughs> it, you know, it seems that way. I've got a lot of friends that are like, man, all you do is fish, but no. Uh, well, you have a day job, you said. <laughs> yeah, I've got, a, you know, I've got a, a day job. I work five days a week, but uh, I do take a lot of vacation. <laughs> <laughs> no, I will probably four days a month at least. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. You know, I think that's something that's also really, really relatable to, you know, the person who has a job. Because <laughs> I got to say, uh, I'm laughing a little bit to myself. We had um, Easter this month and <laughs> we visited both of our families because we love them very much. Um, but we've now missed two weekends of fishing. And wouldn't you know that this is the month that I get like a random survey, Wisconsin DNR. Hey, tell us how your fishing is. Like they don't ask for a whole lot of information, but like how many you're catching, how many you're keeping, you know, and it's just a nice little survey. And it's like, dang it. I've already missed two weekends. Like my log, like this means nothing, but my log doesn't look good here. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Um, so for somebody, you know, who does, I mean, you do fish a lot though. So for somebody who fishes a lot, like what do you use to catch your fish? What's your go-to? So my go-to bait wise is a ATX baby shad. I've got some here. Um, they're a company out of Austin, Texas, and they make all kinds of great little baby shad. Now, I don't know if you can see that very well. Mm -hmm. But on clearer lakes, that is pretty much my go-to color. That's a milk and chartreuse. And when I'm fishing a dirtier water lake like Truman, I go to something like that. Um, that color is dory. And the great thing about ATX, if they don't have a color, 
you can contact those guys and they will make it for you. Okay. Can you like hold up that box real quick? That's like just with the cover on because I can see through it. Yeah. Wow. Look at that. Oh my gosh. You just have like a lot of really great colors there. Yeah. Um, I'm seeing, you know, a lot of kind of natural greens, but in a huge variety of, you know, shades. Cause that sometimes makes a difference, but like you're saying, having that ability, you know, if, if it's darker stained water, if it's very clear water, that does make a little bit of a difference. Yes. And so that's like a, that's a two inch uh, bait uh, that I use and, you know, with live scope anymore, um, if you can't get them to hit a bait, first thing I do is change the profile. And what I mean by profile is a bigger bait. So these are made by the same company and these are a two and a half inch bait and they got a thicker, thicker body to them, just a little longer. I'll switch to that. Um, if I can't get them to hit that, I go, then I start changing action to bait. Um, maybe something with a curly tail. Um, with a paddle tail and uh, any more, you know, like, you know, we've always thought a lot of things like were facts in the fishing world, like colors really mattered. And in clearer water, they do. But in that stained water, we're finding with live scope that it, it really doesn't. It's kind of profile and action. And you can see with, with live scope, the best thing that I found is you can really see how that fish reacts to a bait. And if it's just coming up and nudging it, it's not what it wants. If they're not reacting to it, it's not what they want. So start changing. And I'll, I'll start with color first. I'll stick with that ATX two inch baby shad. Cause that's like my go-to bait and I'll change colors. And after three or four colors, if they're not hitting it, then I'll change profile. If they're not hitting the bigger profile then I'll go to a different action of bait. And well, was it on, uh, it was April 1st, a buddy of mine, he texted me and he, he wanted to go fishing. So I took him and we were using the ATX baby shad and we were catching some fish, but not like we should change to a, a, a two inch Charlie Brewer crappie slider. And I mean, it was just one after another. We probably, we caught over a hundred crappie that day. Okay. 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 So a few things I have, I have a few thoughts in my mind. Okay. I'm, I'm stumbling for words because here's why. Okay. This is not my original thought. I'm switching tracks. Charlie Brewer sliders. So those are a bait that up here more North. I mean, maybe there are some people out there that know all about them, but I stumbled across them randomly at a gas station one time. And I will tell you what, IJO Plastics, I love all of their baits. I use all their baits 90% of the time. That is what is on my hook. But I will tell you what, the Charlie Brewer Sliders has like those one inch little baits and it's a little paddle tail. And that thing will catch fish on days where others don't. And I guess that does bring me back around to the thought I was going to bring up in the first place. One of the things I like about that bait is that size comparatively, it has a little bit more on the body there. Yeah. This is, this is the uh, crappie slider that I use. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I even use that one that's a step smaller than that. Yeah. Yeah. But what I like about those is that little bit of bulk in the body. So not the, not the sliders that we're talking about here, but the other baits <clears throat> that you just showed right before that, they had a lot of bulk in that body and they still had some action in that tail, you know, some wiggle that was great. But I mean, I think sometimes having that larger profile is great. Mm -hmm. A lot of times in the baits that we're seeing these days, they have that like worm like body to slide on the hook. And then it's all these different tails. But I think you got to remember even what fish look like. And sometimes it's more of that round shape. Yes. Yes. So it was a whole bunch of things there. Um, it's hard to not get so excited about tackle because, you know, again, like we're saying, you know, you live very, very far from us, you know, but when there are similar tactics that you can do, you know, that's a really cool thing as an angler. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll tell you one uh, with the, uh, sliders they make a three inch one too that is one of the most versatile baits i've ever fished we use it for white bass there's times i use it for crappie a three inch bait for crappie um walleye they love it mm -hmm. 
Um, and I think I ordered from them because I made that gas station stop that time, picked them up. And then I did make an order um, and they sent me actually in the box like a few things that I didn't order. Just like, I don't know, maybe I got luckier. Maybe they do that for everybody. I don't know. But just a few things. And um, I found I took them out of the box. Oh, dang, I'm never going to use these colors. Put them in my box. And I found that a lot of times I have. So that's kind of a crazy thing that has opened my mind up to some of those uses. Yeah. Yeah. And um switching from baits uh rod wise if i'm fishing dirty water and uh you know murkier water to where i can really get up on the fish and target a specific fish i'm my main go-to rod is a 10 foot rod and i can't show you the whole rod but anyways this rod is made by bone sticks crappie rods um blake chadwick is the owner of it <clears throat> super good guy he just started making these but uh they come in 10 10, 12, and a 13 foot rod. And I keep three of these on my boat with something different tied on them. And I've got a 13 footer for whenever they do get a little bit more spooky. It gives me three more feet of reach, but a uh, super good rod there. It's got an IM 12 blank on it. They're all two piece. Um, he's even getting into, uh, he's got a seven foot spinning series rod out now also. So go check him out. And uh, let's see. When you see, if you see me cast into fish, um, I'm using this, this rod here is a Enigma Phenom. This is a six foot 11 rod. These rods were designed for bass fishing, but they are the best crappie rods. Now this one here, the, the green one, the Phenom, I keep it spooled with six pound test and I don't use it a lot. I mainly use four pound test, but there's times I'm using this one. Uh, this blank is a, uh, it's a, got the uh, Tory or Torre, it's mm -hmm. Torre uh, graphite. <clears throat> and it's a 30 ton, I believe is the rating on the, on the graphite of this. A lot of times you'll see an IM12, IM7, IM6. Um, but the true rating, the IM is actually kind of a generic rating that they came up with. But how they rate graphite is based on, the universal standard is ton. So this is like a 30 ton series blank. Now the main rod that I use when I'm cast into fish is it, this is the Enigma Epon. It's six foot nine. Same thing. It was built for finesse bass fishing. Um, it has lure rating of an eighth to a half ounce and four to 10 pound test line. I throw a 16th ounce jig on this thing. And it cast a jig further than any rod I've ever used. And uh, one reason is they, this rod has 10 eyelets on it. A uh, standard rod, I can't remember, has five or six, I think. Yeah, it can, it can vary a little right. bit. So it's got the micro eyes on it. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the technology behind the micro eyes. But it keeps that line. <clears throat> they, they've found that with those bigger eyes, you get rod slap with your line when it's coming off the spinning reel with that smaller eye, it, it keeps the line. The easiest way for me to describe it in football terms is like when you're throwing a tight spiral, you know, you're going to get a longer pass instead of a wobbly. And uh, so with 10 eyelets on it, it gives you more line to rod contact. Now this is my theory. This isn't, it gives you more line to rod contact. And for me, I truly believe that 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 makes this rod more sensitive I feel bites that I never felt with other rods. Um, this rod is a 30, 40 ton blend of uh, Torre uh, graphite. Super sensitive. It's got a lot of backbone to it. Like I say, it's made for bass fishing. It's got an extra fast tip on it. The, uh, the backbone of the rod, it extends way up from the blank. So get a lot of power in those hooks set on bigger fish. Allows me to swing fish into the boat instead of having to net them. So, super good rods. Enigma Fishing is where you can find those. Now, the Epon, it's a uh, 140 for the rod. The Phenom is like 110. These rods have a lifetime warranty on them. So, go check them out.
Cool. Well, and you were saying that, you know, you were able to lift them out and pick them up into the boat. You know, that says a lot for a run for sure. But man, that says a lot for the kind of crop you're catching because um, <laughs> sometimes they're called paper mouth for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> and it, here's another theory of mine. I really feel that paper mouth term, you know, come from old days and people were, you know, they didn't set the hook on them hard because they, you know, they do have thin lips. But man, I... I have literally set the hook on a fish and yanked it out of a brush pile <laughs> <laughs> and never once the hook come out. <laughs> well, and I think it has a lot to say about, about the, the current hook technology and, and stuff like that. Um, they've come up with a bunch of different shapes and stuff and different lure designs, I think, has helped that as well. So you're not hooking just the lip anymore, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, well, my last fishing trip, I, I had a crappie. It was just under two pounds that I swung right into the boat with that. And oh. Never once thought of it breaking, you know, yeah. <laughs> and the line that I use on these, I'm not sure if you could tell, but I use the colored line. Yeah. This, this is gamma line, um, four pound test on this one, six on the other. Now I'm, I'm not affiliated with gamma. I'm, I'm affiliated with these rod companies, but I'm not affiliated with gamma line, but I, I could not switch from them. They, that line, I've used it for years and it's super good. It's, it's very strong, super sensitive. It doesn't hold memory. It's like a copper polymer. It doesn't hold memory like mono does. On my 10 foot rods, I use 15 pound braid on those. And that, that's just a 15 pound power pro braid is what it is. Yeah, that's cool. I was going to ask because, um, Emily and I, we do we do a lot of trolling, just straight line trolling with with jigs, just because we both like to hold the rod off the side of the boat, and they tend to they tend to hit it a little bit harder when it's on the move. Yes, um, we 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 actually run eight pound braid, and we run the X Plasma by Sunline, uh -huh. and so that's a one pound diameter braid, and then we run that to four pound four pound liters. But our biggest our biggest secret that we I guess it's not a secret. Everybody, we tell everybody, but it's a, it's a, the size twenty eight swivel that we get from Hatena. Yeah. So that's the micro swivel, and that's what we that's how we keep our line from twisting up. Because when you're pulling jigs and stuff like that, especially lighter tackle, you get a lot of that line twist. Yes, you do. And we we don't we don't have to deal with that with that setup. And that swivel is so small; it's a twenty pound swivel, and we we're able to cast it too. Yeah, it's like the it's eyelet, not fair. So it, it's really nice. That is nice. Mm -hmm. So you had, oh, sorry, did I cut you off? No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> so you had talked about your rods and line and all of that. So that's good. Um, what are you using for jigs? Um, like as in jig heads? Well, you yeah. just had mentioned, you know, casting some 16 thou jig heads before. Okay. So I don't know that or what else do you got? <laughs> so, um, She'll take all your secrets, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Mainly, like, if, if I'm casting, most of the time I'm using rubber, the ATX lures. Um, now, I do tie up some of my own jigs. This is a little 16th ounce hair jig that that I use sometimes. Um, I, I kind of go to the hair jig sometimes in the winter, and uh, I like to put scent on, the, on some baits in the winter. Mm -hmm. um, and those hair jigs really seem to hold scent, you know, they soak it up and it, it, it really seems to hold it better than just squirting it on a plastic. Yeah. yeah, that's a good, that's actually a pretty good tip. Cause we, we do a little bit of tying and stuff with feathers and hairs and stuff. Um, but our winter time fishing is vastly different than yours. So yeah. we, don't, we don't necessarily <laughs> use too many hair jigs in the winter, but we, we might, we should try that. Yeah. Now, um, this is a scent that I use. It's uh, called Real Snot. Um, this is the Java. So you don't get all that fishy smell all over you. It smells like coffee. It smells great. Um, but this is also a line conditioner. So you start getting those twists and stuff in your line, you know, squirt it on your line. It's great for that. And uh, like my plastics, when they start to dry out in those containers, I just squirt a little bit of this on there. It keeps them good and pliable and moist. And then they're scented right out of the box. 
Well, and you know, you make a really great point. You know, people at home might be snickering, you know, like you're saying, oh, it smells like coffee, you know, but that really, there are some people out there that that they don't want that, you know, and like, I'll take or leave bait that smells like gross, you know, <laughs> but I think, I think that's especially true for getting people out on the water, you know, if they're new to the sport or if they're not super comfortable with bait or something like that, if you can have something that's coffee scented, that's still doing the job. I mean, I do really think that's cool. Plus actually we have used that stuff and it is kind of awesome. Yeah, <laughs> yeah especially for the line. It's really nice. And actually the first time that I used that stuff, I was, it was, I think it was like two winters ago, I was fishing some brush and thought I was on crappie. I, I seen the fish on my live scope and, had dropped a bait down to him two or three times and watched him come out to it. So I squirted that Java on it. And as soon as I dropped that bait down there, it hammered it. It was like a two and a half pound uh, spotted bass. Oh. <laughs> yeah. That's always fun. That is really fun. Oh man. Well, and it makes me think of actually like last week we talked to Sharon Brown um, and mm -hmm. he was talking about hair jigs and you know, his winter is a little bit non-traditional compared to ours as well, yeah. you know, so hair jigs and he was talking bass. So that's kind of funny. You're making that connection as well. <laughs> um, you know, there's gotta be something to that. Yeah. Well, okay. So this is something I, I kind of thought of while we were talking, you were talking about winter and fishing with hair jigs. So do you have kind of the traditional, midwest winter spring summer fall cycle or do you have like are you far enough south where there's like the double spawn where the water temps get only get down to the 40s and then kind of creep back up no we we have the four seasons uh okay. you know I, this winter i think it was early december i was fishing on truman and i actually busted ice for probably a mile to get to my fishing spot with my boat no it wasn't thick it was it was a quarter inch thick, but I had 36 degree water there. Okay. So pretty, pretty similar. You're fishing a lot of open basin fish and yeah. stuff relating to like deep water points and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. Now, you know, as you say deep water for winter, it's Truman is, is totally different than any lake that I've fished around here. Summer, winter, spring, fall, I'll catch them in. 10 to 15 foot of water and they'll be suspended three foot below the surface. So it's a little, you know, and I, I grew up fishing clear water lakes and, you know, springtime, you're going to catch them 10 to 15 foot, then up on the banks. And then summertime, they're back out 30, 40 foot of water. Mm -hmm. Same the winter on those clear lakes. Yeah. So, you know, as fish do move shallow like this, you know, you're, you're transitioning to that and we're not too far behind, hopefully, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, everybody uses it some sort, or I'm guessing some kind of a bobber setup. You know, not really. <laughs> I, I <feel> that. <laughs> There's some men of fishermen that I see doing that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, when they get real shallow, are you just, you know, hopping jigs around? Are you, what is your method then? I, I'm casting a 16th ounce jig to them. 90 and 95 to 99% of the time, I'm throwing a 16th ounce jig and uh, I'll throw it right up on the bank and just slow reel it through them. Uh, depending on it, they may want it fast some days, you know, but most of the time I'm just slow reeling a, a jig through them. Well, and I have even found that there are times where the fish gets so shallow or, you know, there's like a little bit of a bank and then right away it's like a foot and that's where they are. You know, if you try to cast a bobber up there, you know, that's something you might be sometimes scaring fish more than not. So, you know, especially when it comes to crappies and panfish, I would say, you know, sometimes it's worth going without your bobber. And so it's something that I, if they are that shallow and I can't get them to hit that jig, I'll throw a rebel a floating mm -hmm. rebel to them and catch them. Yeah, that's a good point. That is actually a really good point. You know, I think a lot of times people forget, you know, that fish are eating things at the top at that point. So yeah. that's, yeah. that's a really great thing to do. Um, <laughs> shout out to Sharon Brown. <laughs> you know, we were just talking about you. You're here listening to us. So hello. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. He brings up another, another good point. Um, and, I kind of adopted a similar method and he's saying the float and fly. And, you know, that's a, that's kind of a cool thing to do if you're, if you're ever interested in a little bit of fly fishing, but you just got, you don't want to get into the gear, just go to Bass Pro. They have two packs of the, of clear bobbers and they just twist on your line and with rubber 
and then you can set a fly behind it or a popper or whatever. Oh, and that's really yeah. fun. You can catch crappies and bass and all kinds of stuff on it, you yeah. know, in the springtime. So, yeah. And I like, I've even taken those uh, three inch sliders and took a, a two watt worm hook and just used that and, and cast to them. And that slows the fall down even more so that you're in the strike zone longer in that real shallow water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and you know, what I love about actually both those things is sometimes again, just showing fish things that haven't been thrown at them constantly is a huge key to that. And you know, right off the bat, there's two really great options. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, awesome. So what else is in your magic book of crappie, your magic crappie book? <laughs> you know, uh, live scope, live scope's the new and say upcoming. It's been out for little over a year now um i think uh you know a lot of people think that they can buy this live scope and load a boat with fish and it does help you but you're not going to load a boat with fish if you've not ever done good catching fish you know people that's always caught fish are going to keep catching them no matter what they're using um the biggest thing that i have found with that is you can truly see how a fish reacts to a bait and when you're casting to fish you'd be surprised how long your, your bait is truly in the strike zone. Um, I've had to slow down a lot more than what I used to because my bait wasn't in the strike zone. Like I thought it was. Um, and just the action that you're presenting, there's been times uh, if it's on those clear lakes, when I'm casting the fish, I normally keep my transducer on my trolling motor. That way I can constantly search and I'm chasing fish in, in dirtier water. But when I'm in a clear lake, I've got a pole where I can stick my transducer on that pole and I can set my spot lock on my trolling motor and cast those fish on brush and stay about 20 to 30 feet away from them. And uh, I, this was uh, last year, I think. Um, I was doing this in about 12 foot of water, casting to them letting the jig fall and I could see my 16th ounce jig about 30 feet out on my graph and <clears throat> excuse me, fish were just coming out of the brush like crazy. Just one after another, I was catching them and all of a sudden they quit. I'd see them come out of the brush, but they wouldn't hit it. So I cast back to them, reel it over and get them to come out. And then I just stopped the bait and let it fall and they couldn't resist it. And, you know, so that's where live scope has really helped me just seeing how, how they're reacting to a bait, what they want, when they want it and the type of bait. Yeah, that's really a great point. You know, I think a lot of times people assume, you know, like if the fish are here, they'll eat it, you know, <laughs> they're fast, enough, you know, but slowing it down enough is a huge key. Um, and I think, you know, it's sometimes that's hard because, you know, you want to put on a bigger jig or something with a pattern, or sometimes you get caught up in what's in your tackle box, you know, um, but sometimes, you know, just match that hatch or just Mimicking a little memo, minnow is the best way to go. Yeah. 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 Um, so the other thing I guess I'm interested in hearing about is brush fishing. You know, you talked about that a little bit. Um, do you do much brush fishing? Yeah. On, on clear lakes, uh, you know, I'm targeting fish that are associated with a brush, you know, not always that are in the brush. I, the bigger fish, like I said, they're, they're usually the bigger fish are outside the brush sometimes 10 or 15 feet away. They're not associated to, to that big school of smaller fish that need that brush. And uh, so, yeah, most of the time now, uh, like on Truman, the arm that I fish is dingier and the bigger fish sometimes aren't even, they may be out on a flat and there may be stumps on the bottom, but they're, they're suspended three foot below the surface and, and not even associated to the brush. Hmm. Um, and that's a really great point. I think a lot of times people are, you know, thinking about the brush or the, the topography of the lake and they forget to think about the fish up near the surface. Um, and again, with graphs and stuff, sometimes those fish can be really tough to find. Yeah, that's exactly right. They hide in there very well. And now uh, on these clear lakes, I also fish a lot of bluffs, the bluff banks. And, and the only thing they're really associated with is the bluff itself. And I try to target like bluff cuts because in those bluff cuts, you get like a, a natural staircase in there. So it gives them cover at every depth that they need throughout the day. And, uh, you know, early in the morning, I'll catch them up. And, and this is midwinter even on Lake of the Ozarks. I'll catch them in two foot of water and, and water may be 
40 degrees. And then as the sun comes up, they, they move back down just to where that sun's not hitting them. And they may be at 10 foot. So they use that bluff cut and the stair steps on that bluff cut as their cover. And those crappie are harder to pick out because they're into that hard surface, that rock. And, but, you know, I've done, I, I've done that before life scope, you know, just know they're there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's really interesting hearing about all of that rock because I don't honestly fish with places that are like that very often, you know? And so just the factor of the fish hiding right among that rock is a really great reminder, you know, for anglers, there's a ton of new sportsmen out on the water this year. So, you know, if you're not super familiar with your graph, you know, heads up mm -hmm. for something like that, because again, that's something that's really easy to forget. Um, or even a seasoned angler, it's so easy to trust your graph so much that, you know, you forget like what could be there. Um, but I think, you know, you're talking about that transition and when you have a place that doesn't have all those rocks and steps like that, you know, fish kind of go through something similar sometimes. So sometimes that's a little bit of a, you know, depth difference or, you know, um, depth change or depth difference. You know, sometimes they go down, sometimes they move in and, you know, people will set up in the morning, they'll catch a bunch of fish and they'll be like, wait, where'd they go? You know, but especially with the sun, you know, following them and what they're doing is really key. Yeah. And on those bluffs, they didn't go far. They just went down on that bluff enough to get out of the sun. That's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know, it is makes a bigger difference on the clear lakes versus like something that's stained or cloudy, because again, that's a different kind of pattern. Yeah, that's exactly right. Awesome. Um, so, I mean, as far as all of this, you know, we're talking about fishing in the boat in winter, which is kind of crazy to me. So, um, do you still wear like striker bibs, like the hard water climate, or do you do more of a rain gear? So I, I do not like to be bulky when I'm fishing and I, I wear the striker, uh, base layer. And, uh, then over that I'll wear the insulated sweatpants that striker makes then i'll wear a uh, a shirt over that and i use the adrenaline rain suit as my outer layer and i have fished on some days whenever it was in the teens wind blowing and be just fine that's a really cool thing, mm -hmm. um, you know, because again, that bulk can be a big factor. And especially when you're in the boat, I notice that a little bit more than when I'm on the ice. Um, but the rain gear is great because, you know, it's that whole waterproof thing, but it's windproof. Yes. Yeah. So it makes a huge difference on those cold days. Yeah. And that adrenaline rain suit is by far the best rain suit I've ever wore. <clears throat> I was fishing a tournament on Truman Lake last summer and out of nowhere, a thunderstorm rolled up and, uh, I, we seen it coming. And, uh, so I put on my rain suit and you could see the trees really start to blow. And, uh, there was another gentleman, older gentleman that was fishing the tournament. And he was probably a hundred yards away from me. And I hollered at him. I was like, Hey man, we better go take cover. So we went and beached our boats uh, on a bank that was out protected by the wind. And we had, uh, Oh, it was nickel size hill and rain so hard you couldn't see and 70 mile an hour winds. And I never got wet wearing that rain suit. That's awesome. Yeah. Wow. Well, and it's amazing how quick those conditions do just mm -hmm. come up. You know, as an angler, you're out there um, and being prepared with something like that is huge. Yes. Um, you know, I take like a backpack kind of with me um, and I find that it packs in there really well. So I know not everyone brings a backpack, but, you know, even just to shove it in a car compartment as you go, that's it's going to fit no matter where you're going. Exactly. That's awesome. Um, and I also, you know, it's I don't I don't honestly love fishing in the rain, but I did find that wearing the striker rain gear. Um, I have the Evolve suit um, and you have the adrenaline one, yep. right? Um, but really a huge testament to that suit, because like you're saying, it sounds silly. It's rain gear. You shouldn't get wet, but you yep. don't. Um, and a huge factor of that is actually the breathability of mm -hmm. the rain gear, because, you know, it's not rain gear, like swooshy material, and you're certainly not going to get hot in it. And so, no. you know, there's no moisture from rain or there's no like heat from your body. Like it really does lend to a comfortable fishing day. It mm -hmm. sure does. And I, you know, a lot of these clear lakes I fish, the better fishing days are on days when it rains. So I use it quite a bit. 
Well, um, and that's another thing, you know, especially if you're fishing big water or something like that, you know, if it's just chilly, it doesn't even have to be raining, you know, if it's big waves and sometimes depending on what direction your boat's going in, like there's a lot of splashing that can happen and just being mm -hmm. cold is one of those things that can really detract from a good day. That's exactly right. So I got to ask, we ask everybody, so what's your favorite, what's your favorite piece of striker gear? Oh you had to God. pick one out of all of it. It has to be. Well, the adrenaline rain suit by far, but the new uh, camo hoodie that they have. Oh. I love that thing. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> you you broke you you broke a streak right there because <laughs> so so we this was an in, inadvertent question that Emily had brought up. And for I don't know how many shows in a row now, everybody has said the stealth gloves. <laughs> you know, from <laughs> almost from coast to coast at this point and and I've seen I've seen you fishing them, you know. I've seen pictures with you. Yeah. I have them on, but it is it's awesome to hear that there is other awesome stuff that people hold in higher regard than the stealth gloves. <laughs> <laughs> and I I absolutely hate wearing gloves when I fish. Yeah, me too. Those gloves are amazing. Yeah. They really are. But I I like the new uh, low tide hoodie. Uh, just it's pretty stylish. I I like the camo pattern they put on it. it yeah. It's, it's, yeah. Well, and you know, that, that sun gear, all of it is, yeah. is really comfortable to wear. Mm -hmm. It looks great, you know, functional. Um, and some of that cool technology that they have in those shirts is just, we opened oh a shirt gosh, the other yeah. day and like the material was, was that, noticeably cooler than anything else that we could touch in that room. So, you know, I can't wait to get it out in some heat and try it. <laughs> and yeah. That cool. alpha burr hoodie. That yeah. it's it's crazy it's it's like it was sitting in the refrigerator and it was sitting in our living room <laughs> in the state oh, you might say it was a refrigerator in our living room <laughs> <laughs> but you know the material is even stain resistant on those and yeah you know i you get you're when you're fishing you're getting blood on you a little bit and fish slime and it just comes right out yeah that's super awesome i can't wait to try it out yeah, that is really awesome. <laughs> so, um, you know, I guess what's up next for you in the season? Well, just uh, I got some tournaments coming up. Um, Wally Marshall's putting on uh, he he last two years he's put on the classic and it was an invite only type of tournament. And uh, so what he did is he took the best crappie anglers off of uh, like out of the ACT and the crappie masters and they it was 100 boats in a tournament. And they're fishing for $80,000 for first place, um, paying out 20 spots. So this year to try to get more into it, and he's really wanting to try to get the money in crappie tournaments, like what's in bass tournaments. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he created two qualifying events. One's on Table Rock, which is here in Missouri, and the other one's on Lake Texoma. And uh, unfortunately, the one on Table Rock got canceled. Uh, he couldn't get there there wasn't just enough boats that signed up for it. And oh. a lot, my thoughts on a lot of your crappie tournaments are on stain, stained water lakes and table rock is a super clear lake and uh, it can be really tough to fish, but he had enough to sign up for Texoma. So we will have that one in May. And uh, you know, the, the tournament entry fee they're they're a little steep, but if you want the money to be there, you got to pay the fee. It's, it's uh $1,500 entry fee. So payout's going to be really good on it. Then they're going to take the uh, top 50 out of that tournament and they will qualify for the classic. That's going to be in October down in Shreveport on the red river. And uh, so, man, I, we get enough signed up. Uh, one thing about these crappie tournaments, you know, crappie masters, ACT, you're, you're fishing with working class people. These guys have, mm -hmm you know, a, a day job working five days a week and they fish these crappie tournaments on the weekend and they're, they're really good people. They will share information with you. You go to the boat ramp, you got questions, ask somebody, they, they will share information with you. It's a really good group of people. So, you know, if you haven't signed up for a crappie tournament, just cause you're, you're intimidated maybe a little by, you know, <clears throat> seeing, I don't know if you guys keep up with crappie tournaments, but yeah. You know, like Kevin Rogers, he he actually is on the bass side now, but um, 
Matthew Rogers, one of the top crappie anglers in the nation. That guy is crazy good. I he fishes in that Truman series that I fish, and you just can't beat the guy. He's so good. He's he's like twenty four. He's so good with his electronics. Um, gosh, there's so many of them. Uh, TJ and Alex Palmer. Um, it's a father son team. Those two are super good. Um, I, Mike Valentine, who was the president of Crappie Masters, <clears throat> he's the one that holds the Truman Series Crappie Tournament. He's a super good fisherman. And the guy he fishes with is a full time guide on Truman Lake. But those guys are so, I mean, they're such good acting people. You ask questions, they're going to tell you, you know. So sign up, sign up and learn something, go out and experience it. It's a lot of fun. That's super cool. And so does that, does the crappie tournament in Shreveport, does that line up with the Mr. Crappie Expo? That is the Mr. Crappie Expo. Yes. Okay. That's one, that's one of the expos on our bucket list. Cause we, what we do love following Wally Marshall. And yep. <laughs> every time Emily hears the, mm -hmm, she, she, she can. <laughs> you know, and he's called me like three times or so <clears throat> since, uh, since I signed up and, just man he is a super good person he's fun to talk to he's a character you know and um he's really working hard to try to get the money in crappie fishing um but yeah super good guy easy to talk to well next time you talk to him and tell him that he <laughs> needs some hosts for the crappie expo you know a couple yeah there we go. that'd be great yeah that'd be awesome um, not to be off topic though, but we do actually have a question and now I'm dying to find out. Um, Terry wants to know what is in your fish tank? Oh, I have some koi <laughs> in there. I've had crappie in there, but like they died. So mm -hmm. I haven't put any back in there since. Um, oh, I've got one of those Placo catfish in there. Those are cool. That's it. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Well, the crazy thing about crappies is that we could talk about them all night, <laughs> but at some point it's got to be. Um, but before we let you go, um, you know, for people who want to continue to follow, you know, all of your fishing adventures, how do they do that? Uh, on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, it's all Chris Emery Fishing. Please come subscri uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Um, come follow me on Instagram and Facebook. Excellent. Yeah, it's a good follow for sure. Yeah. Um, and we can't wait to see the fish that you're catching this year and see what you're using. And maybe I'm going to even come fishing one of these days. Let's do it. <laughs> yep. Awesome. So for everybody out there. Yeah. Thanks for being here. On the night. Or no, on the line and striker. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I don't ever sign off. It's your turn. You <laughs> to all the people at home, <laughs> thank you for being here. And thank you to Chris. And thank you for Josh for trying. That was really awesome. <laughs> but it was a great episode. And we cannot wait to see you guys next weekend on Hook, Line, and Striker. Okay. I'll stick to my line. <laughs> Good night, guys. <laughs>